by taking River Ridge, they were able to take Belvedere, and then they began to roll over the Germans like a fucking tsunami. And I am convinced that their ability to move as quickly and ferociously as they did was a function of that training that they underwent for three years, you know, at Fort Lewis on the flanks of Mount Rainier, and then at Camp Hale in Colorado. And also that, what I like to call the fellowship of the rope. That gave them such an incredible fighting spirit that the U.S. Army's 5th Army, which had been charged with resupplying them, couldn't keep up. I mean, they were ferocious. And it's because of that training and because of that esprit de corps. I have something. I have something, too. Uh Uh-oh. Well, mine is related to the episode, so should we do yours first? Sure. Guys, welcome back to Mops and Mo's. Another week with Drew and Alex. Um, Happy to have you. Me first? Go for it. So, okay. You don't know this yet. This might make you mad. Oh, boy. Long-time listeners will will know and be intimately familiar with Operation Dumb Phone, which is what I am calling Mm -hmm. my... uh, I'm trying for people that don't know, like I'm slowly deleting everything off my iPhone. I've turned it into black and white. Uh, Instagram's gone. YouTube's gone. This week, I deleted email. No longer have email on my phone, which interestingly, I'm not like you're right. I'm mad. (laughs) I'm not like I'm not somebody who like sits there and stares at their emails. I, I think some CEO types and stuff, you know, they get a million emails. But I was listening to this guy talk about it. Um, and he mentioned, uh, Two things that I thought were like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Number one, you can't even really write good emails on your phone. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that's fair. And then the second one, which really got me was, he said, email effectively creates these like open anxiety loops because Mm -hmm. what will happen is you'll see an email, you'll glance at it, you'll see it. It will create a thing you have to solve, but you can't respond in that instant. So you just think about it for the rest of the day. Correct. And it occupies real estate in your brain. And I'm sitting there thinking email was designed as an extension of snail mail. Me having mm-hmm. email on my phone and just constantly seeing if I'm getting new emails is like me standing at the mailbox and just waiting for mail to show up. So deleted it off my phone. Now I only check it during the day on my computer when I have time to sit down and actually answer these emails. Let me tell you, of all the things I've done, Turn my phone black and white, deleted Instagram, all the things. The email move has been the most impactful and I highly recommend it. So I, I'm i mad from the standpoint of I send you emails for and most and most things. I, and you're, I get you're just as responsive. I'm not even that responsive yeah, to most see? emails. So I'm not that mad really. I, I agree with you on several levels. Um, one is there was a meme going around recently. I appreciated it. Um, people of the younger generations understand that Certain tasks are for the big internet and certain tasks are for the small internet. That's a great way to put it. Like if you're if you're booking flights, you can't book your flights on your phone. No. Like I know you technically can, but that's big, big internet. internet activity. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so like it's it's a good partitioning of your activities between big internet and small internet. I like that. I'm stealing that. I also agree with the anxiety loops piece. Mm-hmm. Um, I've talked about this before on here, but the DMs on Mops and Moes are a huge piece. Like, I get the notification. I can see the first little bit of the message. I'm, no, I'm not going to answer it right away, but it's going to stick in my brain. And like, I can, if the vibe of the message is like angry or accusatory, I'm going to wonder what it is. See? It's a whole thing. And I, I'm also guilty of like, especially now as like more people are emailing me, people are sending me messages on Mops and Mo's. I still have like friends and family texting me and things like that. It gets overwhelming sometimes. And what that results in is I'm not as responsive. It takes me a while to get back to people on things. But the problem is if it's something I know I need to respond to, but I'm not going to respond to right away, I leave the notification in my like notifications oh. thing. So it'll build up to the point where there's like a couple emails I got to respond to. There's a couple texts I got to respond to. I don't do this with the DMs. DMs are never like a high enough priority to stay in the notifications, but I will get swamped with like, I think right now I have like two emails I got to deal with on here. But is it an emergency? Text. It's not. It's definitely not. See? And it's not like a healthy way of handling it. And I should partition it like you're talking about. So we have a situation where I am trying to eliminate more and more. And it sounds like you're adding more and more. Yeah, it's not good. The people should stay tuned to see who lives longest and is healthiest and happiest. 
So I have, I now have an iPhone 12 mini. So I have a sm the smallest cell phone possible. It's in black and white. There's no social media on it. There's no YouTube. Now there's no email. The guy I was listening to also deleted his web browser. That might be a step too far. He uses maps as his web browser. What? Which I thought was an interesting move. Yeah. So there you go. Okay. Well, that was, I mean, that was a value dense bit of preamble before this episode. Um, I'm actually going to save my banter for the next one of these we do because it's <laughs> it feels less important now compared to that. Put it in an email. I'll check it on my computer. There we go. I'll check it on my computer later. I'll I'll do a short version of it and we won't necessarily have the full conversation because you probably don't care about it actually. Um, <laughs> there's been, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle on the gram the other day. I don't care. Um, the army, the army published an ad featuring 10th mountain division. Oh, I, I, would, do right I would argue that it was a bit misleading in that they focused on the hail to veil ski traverse, which was done with like a small select group of people. They TDY would out here to Colorado to do ski things. And I don't, I don't think it necessarily reflects the reality of what 10th mountain soldiers experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think it's relevant because we're about to have a huge conversation on this episode about the 10th mountain. Some people, at least a couple people took that as somehow like disparaging to 10th mountain. I think 10th mountain is awesome. I think the legacy is awesome. I think you will hear that in this episode. I just worry that, and I've, I've seen other conversations with this, comparing the way the army advertises to the way the Marine Corps advertises and things like, what if we just like advertise the actual things we do and if we think that training is cool and important like the mountain stuff for 10th mountain then what if we actually had 10th mountain really doing that training then so we could film real training and not a pr stunt well then you'd have to have marines scaling stone castles in the middle of lava cauldrons and fighting dragons with they do there were some dragons in some of their marketing work i mean there. that unequivocally the best <laughs> military commercial of all time. The That's second fair. best one might be the old Navy SEAL commercial where there's like footprint. There's it's the beach and the waves are coming up. And then and then there's footprints. It is oh my God. I still Navy. think we need to bring back the Army Strong song. I cannot people listening to this, please send us an example if you disagree with me. I cannot think of a cool army recruiting commercial. There's some fantastic army recruiting ads. They're just older than we would hope. We're talking previous generation stuff. Nothing holds a candle to the Marine fighting the dragon. Now I'll send you some stuff that's better than the fighting the dragon stuff. Who are we talking to today? That's a, a good, harsh transition. I'll accept it. Um, first, I'll explain who our guest is, and then I'll explain the project he's working on that we brought him on the podcast to discuss. Um, some of you will already know him, especially if you're the kind of people who are emotional about the 10th Mountain Division conversation. Uh, we have Christian Beckwith with us today, um, founder and board chair of the Teton Climbers Coalition. He has spent more than 30 years immersed in the world of alpinism. In 1996, he became the youngest person to edit the world's premier mountaineering journal, and I'm going to consolidate the next part of his bio because it seems like doing that gave him the bug for entrepreneurial efforts. Um, so I'm just going to list him fast. Um, the Alpinist Magazine, the Alpinist Film Festival, the Teton Boulder Project, Outer Local, the Town Pump Bouldering Series, Shift, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the advancement of nature as a social determinant of health, uh, Alpin Film, and that is not even all of the projects he launched. Um, he has made expeditions to Kyrgyzstan, Alaska, Peru, and Tibet. He has skied the Grand Teton half a dozen times and established numerous first ascents and descents around the globe. In 2023, he was inducted into the 10th Mountain Division's Warrior Hall of Fame for services rendered to the division. And the reasons why are exactly what we will discuss here in this episode. He lives in Jackson, Wyoming with his wife and daughter. Now... The story of the 10th Mountain Division is famous for good reason. Um, not only did their insertion into the war help end Germany's occupation of Italy, but post-war, its veterans founded and developed ski areas across America, started companies like Knowles and Nike, launched the fields of avalanche science and wilderness rescue, and are all around kind of godfathers of the outdoor recreation industry that is now huge in the United States. Uh, 90 pound rucksack is the project that Christian has launched. 
Um, it is a podcast that examines the stories that made the unit famous, as well as some of the stories that history has forgotten. Equal parts real-time research, intimate conversation, and revelatory journalism, 90 Pound Rucksack explores not only the conventional wisdom around the 10th, but the transformative power of the mountains to forge a collective identity among mountain troops. And more broadly, to ignite a passion for the outdoors that reshaped American society in the process. Again, something for sort of the longtime listeners. If you think back to the episode that we had with Dr. East, I think me certainly and you as well, there's this kind of fascination, romanticization about kind of physical culture in the World War II-ish 30s, 40s, for good reason. I mean, and, and we get into it in this episode with Christian and the conversation around creating from scratch, effectively, an alpine fighting force to go toe-to-toe with arguably the most elite alpine fighting force during World War II, which would be the Germans, and what it was in the fabric of those soldiers that allowed them to do that on such a short notice. And um, it's just, it's interesting. It's always been interesting for me putting that next to the narrative today around the military. And this isn't a knock on the military necessarily, but these conversations we keep having around soldiers not being fit enough to fight. And and could we go to war in such short notice these days? And so a little bit of an existential tangent on my part just there, but I think to give some context as to why this is an important part of the Mops and Most conversation, you will hear a, a large piece about what it was that allowed those men to be so successful. And before we launch into the episode, just a couple quick ones. Um, one, it does all tie together because that hail to veil ski thing from the army ad, Christian was there. He did participate in it. You'll hear a little bit about it. And also, I just got to say, I'm sure we say at the end of the episode, I honestly don't remember um, definitely go subscribe and listen to 90 Pound Rucksack. It uh, it puts our production value to shame. I'll I was be honest say, about that. You're about to hear what a real podcaster sounds like. Yeah, it is no joke. First off, he has a fantastic, fantastic podcaster voice. Yeah, it does. Also, just a much higher degree of research, production value, editing. He's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, it's fantastic. You should check it out. So, uh, as they say, up in 10th Mountain... Uh, enjoy this week's episode and uh, climb to glory to the top those, all those red books right there I'm capturing this for the people those are the Witcher series those are not anything that like makes me look smart <laughs> is the Witcher still that's nah, probably another conversation because uh, Henry Cavill left right yeah I, I haven't watched any since and I've never heard anybody say Cavill I thought it was Cavill, Cavill? shit you're right but I haven't watched any since he left, so I don't know. I can't speak for the quality without him. This has absolutely nothing to do with 10th Mountain. So I want to ask this first question because this is a question that I had when Alex brought this podcast up to me. But please explain, what does 90-pound rucksack have to do? Like, what is the, what does that phrase come from? Well, so they used to train with 90 pounds on their back. And there was a very, very famously, there was a song called 90 Pounds of Rucksack that they put together in 19, the winter of 1942, when they were training out of, um, they were training out of Fort Lewis, Washington, but Fort Lewis, Washington didn't have any skiing. So they actually commandeered the leases of a couple of lodges on the flanks of Mount Rainier. And they learned to ski there and they learned to ski with 90 pounds on their back. That's paradise camp, right? Correct. Do we know why 90? Cause my follow on question was like, why not, why not like a hundred or 80? Do we know it just randomly? 90 got famous because of the song, but they trained with more than 90 at times. Less with 90 at times, more with That's more fair. 90 at times. But they trained with a, I think the technical term is it's a fuck ton of weight. <laughs> I think that I think right. I think that uh that unit of measurement still exists, actually. It's a very measurement, yeah. Yeah, certainly in the military. So I guess given that, what motivated you to start? the podcast on 10th mountain oh i have a penchant for rabbit holes i guess um welcome i was i was doing a you know i'm a climber and i've been a climbing historian for a long time i live in the tetons there was no history of climbing in the tetons so i figured i'd write one and i got all the way up until the war and all of a sudden all the climbing in the tetons came to a screeching call and i was like well what happened 
And I'd heard about the 10th Mountain Division. I'd known um, that a number of climbers and skiers had been part of it. So I started researching that and I am still falling down the rabbit hole because apparently it has no bottom. How does, how does one get into climbing, like a climbing historian role? I've never heard of that before. <laughs> uh, I can't speak to, I don't think it's actually an actual thing. I, just <laughs> have, I have to be able to tell my daughter I do something so that when she goes to school, she's not embarrassed. <laughs> so I started my first climbing magazine in uh, 94. You know, I live here in Jackson, Wyoming, and um, that led to another publication called the American Alpine Journal, which is a compendium of significant ascents from around the world. It's been, uh, it's been published since 1929. So I did that for six years. And then I started a climbing magazine called Alpinist, which kind of mm -hmm. took all the fucking awesome shit that's going on all over the world and kind of put it in between two thick stock covers. It was gorgeous. And that is how I got my start. So I can't speak to anything else because there aren't a lot of us out there, frankly. <laughs> Your podcast is all about the history of the 10th Mountain Division. I do have questions I want to dig into with you about like present day 10th Mountain Division, but I think I'll save those for later in the in the conversation here. Can you start us off by just kind of introducing some of the key characters that you follow as you go through the 90 pound rucksack stories? Sure. I'll start with my um, <clears throat> the fellow who kind of got me into it, and his name is John McCown. And so, as I said, I was I was writing this story on climbing in the Tetons and hit the war and everything came to a screeching halt. So I started looking around for um, ways to tell the story of how climbers from the Tetons influenced the evolution of the 10th and then how the 10th in turn influenced the evolution of climbing in the Tetons after the war. And I figured out a way to tell the entire story of the 10th mountain, the division from the perspective of the Tetons with the exception of the signature action of the 10th Mountain Division in the war, which was the ascent of something in Italy's Apennine Mountains called Reaver Ridge. Mm -hmm. and I was looking all over. I could not find a single person from the Tetons who had anything to do with Reaver Ridge. It was driving me absolutely insane. And then um, as part of my work for the history book on, the, on climbing in the Tetons, I had transcribed all the summit registers from, from the Tetons leading up to the war. So on top of the Grand Teton, Tiwanad, Owen, Middle, all, all the peaks in the Tetons, there are these summit registers and climbers would make entries into them. I transcribed them so I could get a sense of the ecosystem of climbing because I wanted to know who was climbing with whom, what they were encountering, you know, the sort of, um, I wanted more than just names and numbers. I wanted to try to get a glimpse into the vibe of the, of the era and I was reading over a, a military history of the 10th and it had something to do with Reaver Ridge. And it mentioned this one name, John McCown and the light bulb went off because I remember transcribing that name. And I went back into all the transcriptions and lo and behold, there was John McCown in 1939 with his brother Grove and their friend, Ed McNeil. And they're all over the Tetons. And then in 1940, they're here again and they're really starting to push the boat out. They're doing, I mean, for the second year of climbing, they were really, they were climbing some audacious routes. And suddenly I had that piece of the puzzle for that story on the history of climbing in the Tetons. But then the more I learned about John McCown, the more fascinated I became with him. And I realized there was a bigger story to tell. And so like a lot of the, a lot of the characters that kind of went into the 10th Mountain Division, he was very well educated. The 10th Mountain Division was started in part with the participation of two civilian organizations. So this has never happened before in the history of the army or the military, where the army worked in concert with the American Alpine Club and the National Ski Association and its subsidiary, the National Ski Patrol System, to vet and recruit troops for the mountain, for the mountain unit. And as part of that process, they were reaching out to all the uh, ski teams that were taking, you know, that were in place um, in colleges like Dartmouth, for example. And as a function of that, they were they got a lot of recruits who are wicked smart, as we used to say in name. <laughs> and they uh, um, they got John McCown that way too. So he had gone to Wharton. He'd actually begun his first year at the University of Virginia Law School, 
when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And the second it was bombed, he dropped out of law school and he signed up for the mountain troops because of his, his um, background in climbing here in the Tetons. And so a lot of the folks that were coming in, they had this dimension to them that was, um, it was, it was pretty rare in the space. And I think another thing that was really rare was that they were the expertise. So America had never had a mountaineer before. We had no culture of mountaineering. We had no clue how to stand up a, a unit to go up against, you know, for example, Germany's Gebirgsjäger. They had three divisions of mountain troops before the war. We had eight divisions. The U.S. Army had eight divisions total of soldiers before the war. So we were really starting from scratch, and it was in large part to, uh, thanks to the expertise of people like John McCown, that the unit was able to begin to develop the doctrine, the techniques, the training programs necessary to stand America's very first unit of mountain troops up from scratch. So as we get into this, I think it's important to paint a picture of like what mountaineering was and what skiing was and what climbing was at this time. Because I know like I, I got into climbing and skiing a few years ago. I'm very much an amateur, but like if I go down into my garage, I've got like black diamond ropes and marker griffin bindings and some cool quick draws and like all this easy to use, really reliable, really safe kind of stuff. What were they using and like what did conditions look like if you were getting into these kind of like pretty serious mountain expeditions in this era? Well, this is another hallmark of the division. A lot of the folks that were coming in not and this isn't exclusive but the people that were skiing and climbing before the war had means you know they came from money because a lot of the equipment was coming from not skiing per se because there were there was a culture of skiing in america before the war it had it had exploded in the five years prior to the war but it really had exploded there were between one and two million skiers in america before 1941 and that was a function of uh, a few things, you know, out of the depression came these things called the ski trains, and they were bringing skiers from Boston up to New Hampshire, in part to stave off bankruptcy for the railroads. And then we also had um, the advent of the of the lift of the rope tow, and suddenly you didn't have to walk uphill in order to ski. And so this made skiing really accessible to the masses, as it were. Climbing was just minuscule. There were, I've counted the number of people who were capable of technical climbs in the United States before the war. There were 500. And I've got a climbing historian friend, so that makes, you know, of the, of the eight of us that are out there, <laughs> he argues that there were a thousand. So somewhere between 500 and a thousand people knew how to, um, to climb technically. <clears throat> and so a lot of the ski gear specifically for downhill skiing existed. You could buy boots, you could buy skis, you could buy bindings. Climbing gear, you had to get everything from the place where climbing had actually been in vogue for over 100 years, and that was Europe. So the best equipment, the pitons and the ropes and the carabiners and the ice axes and the crampons came from places like Germany and Austria and Italy and France. And come 1940-41, they were no longer in the business of doing business with America. So we had to start from scratch and develop our own. So as you're saying that, I'm thinking of like, I mean, you mentioned 500 competent climbers, maybe a thousand, but we're standing up a division here, which is large. So I, I would imagine that that sort of crux to the use of climbing term, that kind of core group of, of folks had to somehow figure out how to like industrialize their skill set and spread that out to a division size element. Can you kind of walk through what that process looked like to bring your average GI up to speed on what it meant at that time to be a mountain capable soldier? That, I mean, it's such a fascinating question, right? And um, the reason my eyes are bleeding today is because I'm trying to answer it with this <laughs> episode I'm working on, which is just killing me. But uh, you know, the last, so I'm, I'm in the midst of a two-part sort of mini-series yeah. on the development of the gear and the clothing and the rations, the food mm -hmm. that was necessary to develop for the mountain troops to be able to train. And it's just so complicated because the war is so complicated. We went from an army of 200,000 soldiers and eight divisions before the war 
to an army of, um, what do we have, 215 divisions and 8.8 .8 million soldiers by 1943. That's what it was going to take to defeat Hitler and the, and the um, Axis powers. And to ramp up, you know, to go from the world's 17th largest army to the largest army in the world in three short years required the complete conversion of Ameri American manufacturing into the arsenal of democracy. So, I mean, how do you, like, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to <laughs> articulate this, and uh, it's just so vast and sprawling and unbelievable. I mean, it is just so difficult to wrap your head around everything that went into making this happen, this miracle that ended up in the defeat of Hitler, which, you know, Hitler was going to win if we hadn't mm -hmm. gotten involved. Um, so the, the entire, um, the story of the process alone, it's, well, I'm at an hour and 36 minutes on this current episode, <laughs> and I'm just beginning to talk about how the ripple effect, because they developed all this gear and clothing and the expertise, the, the mountain doctrine, and then post-war became army surplus. And post-war, these guys came back and they wanted to fan back out into the mountains that they'd fallen in love with while they were training. And that was really the catalyst for outdoor recreation as we know it in America today. Mm -hmm. So it just had this, this seismic impact on society because outdoor rec today is a 1.7, uh, sorry, it's a, uh, it's a $1 trillion a year industry. That's bigger than utilities. It's bigger than ag. It's bigger than oil and gas. And it all... It didn't begin with the 10th Mountain Division, but they sure as hell gave it the short, sharp shove that pushed it into the sort of being that we understand it to be today. Mm -hmm. So I know Drew has something he wants to ask you, but first, just for the listeners, breaking the fourth wall for a second, when he talks about like struggling to put an episode together and all the complexity and the content and stuff, that is because Christian's podcast is dramatically more polished than ours, dramatically better <laughs> researched than ours, like actual serious behind the scenes work. Well, he's a climbing historian. And you can tell when you listen to it that it is a different caliber of podcast than ours. I just want to <laughs> announce that very clearly. <laughs> well, okay, fine. So off the back of that, let me ask an unpolished question for you, <laughs> which kind of follows on my my train of thought when I asked the, the preceding one. At the time, and, and to be fair, I haven't spent much time around the modern 10th mountain division and we'll get into some of this later, but like for all intents and purposes, I don't think the baseline level of alpinism in that current organization is, you know, they're, they're not climbing arduous peaks. So pre world war two, like as they're spinning up this new concept, do you have a sense of what the baseline level of aptitude for actually like conducting yourself in the mountains was and what they were kind of training soldiers up to? Does that make sense? Yeah, the baseline was zero. Yeah. There was nothing. The, um, if you look at just the clothing and um, the, the gear, it hadn't been updated since 1914. We had nothing. I mean, we had some, some um, garrisons up in Alaska, so we needed cold weather clothing for that. But basically, armies don't like to fight in the, in the winter. It's too resource intensive. And so you know, we had no history of it, but we hadn't been involved in World War I. The Italians and Austrians had been mired in war mountain warfare for three years in the Dolomites. I mean, they lost 200,000 soldiers to mountaineering accidents alone during that war. They lost 60,000 soldiers to avalanches in the Dolomites over the course of three winters. I mean, they knew firsthand what mountain warfare was all about. And these countries, they're alpine. I mean, they've got mm. the Alps there. And people have been going into the Alps forever, you know. So we, so people know how to move about. And that, um, that cultural understanding movement in the mountains uh, informed the military understanding of mountain warfare for those countries. You look at America, and particularly before the war, we had, a, you know, just a tiny little sliver of mountain culture in this country. But it was the province of people that had cash and time. And this, it was really beginning to take off in the 1920s. But think about it. That's when the depression hit, you know, mm. by the end of the 20s. So it really became the province of people who had, you know, who could take, um, if you look at K2, so this is the world's second highest mountain. In 1938, there was an American expedition that involved a number of people who are main 
characters in my story because they became main characters in the 10th Mountain Division story. In order to go to K2, which is in Pakistan, it's in a range called the Karakoram, they needed six months. So that includes the travel all the way over to Pakistan. And then the 350 mile trek where they had to walk to the base of the mountain. And then the six weeks on the mountain at altitude, establishing progressively higher camps in order to make their summit push. And they actually reached 8,100 meters, which was higher than anybody had ever been in history. But just to, that sort of undertaking, you know, America just didn't have any of that background. And Europe had just so much more of that background than we did. Mm -hmm. In order to get up to where we were by the time we inserted in Italy in 1945, early 1945, again, I mean, I, I've started thinking about it as almost a miracle. The fact that we were able to get that number of people, 15,000 people trained up and competent enough to be able to execute the nighttime ascent of River Ridge in, on February 18th, 1945, boggles my it boggles my mind and mm -hmm. you know i went over there this last summer and so did the 10th mountain division and um they went up uh there are four routes that were used for the taking of river ridge they went up uh route number two which is fairly moderate um but still kind of you know somewhat steep i went up route three which was the route that john mccown put up on river ridge and i kind of poo-pooed it going in thinking you know probably not probably fairly straightforward. I mean, they got a company of, he got a company of 270 men up at under the cover of darkness. They didn't use lights because there were Germans on top. So I was like, well, it can't be that hard. I knew he had fixed six pitches. So um, there are six sandstone bands on this route. And I thought, well, okay, there'll be that, but that would just be scrambling and then I'll be able to get up and I'm doing it in August. It kind of, it kind of opened up a can of whoop ass on me. It was, <laughs> it was way harder than I expected. It was steep. It was, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're kind of scrambling through um, just, you know, these steep sided, heavily forested hillsides, deep ravines, the sandstone bands. There was one of them that um, I got up it, but it was not the responsible family man kind of thing to do. And I've talked to general Anderson, the commanding officer of the 10th mountain division about this, and I've, you know, I had an episode where I, I interviewed him and Command Sergeant Major Mobar, second in command at the tent. And I said, could you get your soldiers up something like Reaver Ridge now? And he hedged his, <laughs> he kind of, he hedged his response. Um, he said, we would figure out a way up. Oh, nice. <laughs> but they got a thousand people up. Yeah. I, he, would be shocked if the 10th Mountain Division could get a thousand people up Reaver Ridge under cover of darkness in the middle of February with Germans waiting on top to kill him today. So that was in one night, a thousand people. Yeah. Jeez. So before we get to, like, we're going to probably do a little more discussion of like the actual conflict there, but, and this is knowing that you like us are prone to going down rabbit holes. I'll try and keep you to the wave tops on this one, but some of the key training events that happened in preparation for that if you want to hit any of those because I, I i don't know the history nearly like you do but i know from being at 10th mountain briefly um you get exposed to some of it so like seneca rocks some of the paradise camp stuff you've already talked about on your podcast the d series exercise some of that stuff was absolutely incredible so if you want to touch on any of that before we get to in europe yeah i'd say you know there are a number of um, pivotal moments that people can look at as um, examples of the fruition of the training. But I think the way I've come to think about this is the way I, I think about, you know, sort of what I love to do. I love to go into the Tetons and you go into the Tetons and it always takes a full day. And so your pack, you know, it actually weighs a lot more in summer than winter because Typically in winter, we're just doing some, you know, ski mountaineering or, or just backcountry skiing. So your packs weigh like whatever, 30, you know, 25, 30, 40 pounds. In the summer, they can weigh more than that because you got two ropes and you got a full rack and uh, all that hardware. Just it just weighs a lot. And um, these days take eight, 10, 12 hours at a stretch. I mean, 
the saying is you can do anything in the Tetons in a day, but a day is defined by 24 hours. What these guys were doing was going out in the mountains similarly again and again and again to execute their missions, whatever they were assigned to do. If you go into the mountains with big loads again and again and again, you develop the sort of fitness that I refer to as the fitness of the mountain of a mountain athlete. Mm -hmm. and that was absolutely at play by the time they deployed to Italy. The other thing that they had, and I, I, um, I'm trying to make the argument with the podcast that this was central to their success is the camaraderie that's developed between the people that go into the mountains again and again and again, because when you're going into the mountains, you rely on your partners and in climbing, we call it the fellowship of the rope. And it, um, it was absolutely key to their esprit de corps. And so if you look at when they hit Italy, you know, so River Ridge was the kickoff event. And by securing River Ridge, they were able to take something called Mount Belvedere the next day. And that helped break, you know, it helped them attain their objective, which was to break Hitler's Gothic line. And so the Gothic line was this fortified series of summits and ridges in the Apennines Mount, in the Apennine Mountains that Hitler had been using to tie up Allied forces for over 500 days. And so by taking River Ridge, they were able to take Belvedere, and then they began to roll over the Germans like a fucking tsunami. And I am convinced that their ability to move as quickly and ferociously as they did was a function of that training that they underwent for three years, you know, at Fort Lewis on the flanks of Mount Rainier, and then at Camp Hale in Colorado. And also that, what I like to call the fellowship of the rope. That gave them such an incredible fighting spirit that the U.S. Army's 5th Army, which had been charged with resupplying them, couldn't keep up. I mean, they were ferocious. And it's because of that training and because of that esprit de corps. Can we, I mean, I hesitate to say, can we dive down that rabbit hole? Because I know the three of us will. Um, but I'm just curious to hear more from you on that. Because when I hear you talk about mountain fitness and and kind of exposure to the mountains, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, traditionally thinking of like small groups of guys going and, and hitting an objective for a day, but kind of rewinding a bit, thousands and thousands of, of people building that aptitude and building that fitness, like just logistically, what does that look like at that time to get that many people onto an objective, which I, I can imagine would be quite difficult and just get enough reps in to have that many thousands of people be competent enough to move at the pace that you're talking about with the fitness that they would have had to move at that pace. I'm just curious if there's more, more there. Well, I mean, they essentially had to live the mountain lifestyle, you mm -hmm. know, the, the mountaineering lifestyle. They had to be in the mountains all the time. And they just had to be get going out there every single week, day after day after day, in order to develop. Because it's, it's not just physical fitness, you know, in the mountains, shit happens. You will die if you're not if you don't have your head on straight, you know, you're going to get taken out by avalanches. You're going to get hit by rockfall. You're going to, you know, you're, if you're climbing, you have gravity to deal with. So any mistake is magnified. And in order to avoid those mistakes, you have to have uh, a tremendous amount of experience. And usually good, good judgment is born out of bad experience. So I think they probably had a lot <laughs> of bad experiences, but all of that is key to developing those mountain smarts that keep you alive when you are in the mountains. So the fitness is a huge part of it, but then you also have to develop that sort of knowledge of how to move competently, safely, efficiently, and effectively in the mountains. And to be honest, you know, I'm sitting here reading through all these old books and papers and going down to the Denver public library, going through the files. But what's been so interesting to me and so helpful in my understanding of how they were able to pull this whole thing together has been my interactions with the current 10th Mountain Division. So if, just as I was starting the podcast, I got a call from the 10th and they said, hey, we heard your podcast. Will you come out and speak? And, and I was wow. like, are you fucking kidding me? I mean, you want me to, what? You want me to come out to Fort Drum and tell the story of the 10th Mountain Division 
to the tenth to the tenth mountain division. To the tenth mountain, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. And what I hadn't realized was the 10th Mountain Division was mountain in name only. Mm -hmm. They really had no mountain no mountaineering expertise, no no climbing, no skiing. They when they were so they were deactivated after the war. So late December 45, they were reactivated in 85. But that's right about when the global war on terror started. So they yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah. So as a light infantry unit, they're going over to the mid east all the time and the, those mountaineering skill sets were simply not needed and so they were the most heavily deployed unit in the army but they weren't going into the mountains and so that um the whole uh idea of 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 that mountain institutional knowledge as well as all the training that's necessary to be able to execute in the mountains it was it's it just has never been there since 45 but just as I got over to Fort Drum, just as I started the podcast, they started redeveloping those skill sets and watching them redevelop them and then actually embedding with them. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that on some of these mountain endeavors has really opened my eyes to just how fucking hard it is to train an entire division to be able to move safely and effectively in the mountains. It's it's um, it's amazingly difficult. And what's so amazing about it as well is that they're essentially <laughs> traveling the exact same path that the original division traveled when it was making all this stuff up from scratch, including the resistance from within the War Department that had a great degree of skepticism that America even needed a mountain unit. <laughs> like the, the, the fact that the first iteration of the 10th Mountain Division came together at all, that is a miracle in part because the war department really just didn't think that a light infantry unit with these specialized skill sets at a time when America had to ramp up from those eight divisions and 200,000 soldiers to the 215 divisions and 8.8 .8 million soldiers in three years, the whole idea of a specialized unit in the midst of that was ludicrous. And then you throw in the fact that in order to get all their 75 millimeter howitzers and other material around in the mountains, they were using mules. <laughs> and so they were like, what the fuck are we going to do with a unit that's dependent on mules for its <laughs> movement? I mean, there was a huge degree of skepticism within the War Department. We're starting everything from scratch. We got to ramp up like the world has never seen before just to you know have a fighting chance against Hitler. And you got these guys coming up with um, this idea of a, of a mountain unit. You're fucking crazy. And I think that same skepticism is, is absolutely at play today. And if it weren't for the vision and the leadership of General Anderson and people like Command Sergeant Major Mobar, it wouldn't happen. But what has happened over the course of the last couple of years is there has been a lot of momentum that has developed in part because of these visionaries, but it also is sort of um, self-activating, self-perpetuating to a degree. Whether or not they're actually able to pull off that return to those military mountaineering capacities remains to be seen. And we can talk about some of the things they're up against, but I, for one, would like my country to have a unit that could deploy in cold weather and mountain situations and succeed. Hmm. I want to fill in a couple gaps in the story there just really, really fast and then move into some of the like things that are going on now. And and for one, you mentioned February 1945, Riva Ridge as like the decisive point of 10th Mountain operations in Europe. Like only three months after that, the Germans surrender, right? So like May 1945, they surrender. And then six months after that, the 10th Mountain Division comes back to the United States, they get to what is now Fort Carson, then Camp Carson, and they deactivate. So like less than a year after their decisive battle, the division doesn't exist anymore. And then fast forward 40 years, almost to the week from the Battle of Reaver Ridge, I think it was like very, very close to the anniversary of that battle. The 10th Mountain reactivates at what I'm, I'm not as good on my history as you are. I think it was Pine Camp at the time, what became Fort Drum. And my understanding of how that decision was made is it had nothing to do with mountains and everything to do with the Canadian side of the border had been able to undercut the American side of the border on paper milling. 
And so that industry was collapsing <laughs> in upstate New York and they needed an economic rescue plan. And the Senator came up with a great idea of let's cram a division in here. And that was the economic rescue for upstate New York. And like you said, they are now mountain in name only the same way that 101st is only an airborne division in name only. Sorry, air assault friends, but like <laughs> this, this creates this whole scenario, but you're talking about like the utility of it. And I think the utility goes beyond just the strategic importance of mountain capabilities, but we did an episode months ago with the now former commander of the 173rd, the airborne brigade in Italy. And one of the core things they now do to build resilience and team cohesion is they take groups of airborne infantrymen into the mountains of Italy with Alpini guides and make them do hard stuff in the mountains together. And so like <laughs> you talked about how it's like growing organically because this develops the things we were looking for in ways that are important to more than just the tactics of mountain warfare. But I, I just wonder what your perspective on some of that is given that and I, it's up to you whether you want to answer the question yet or push it off to later, but how do you create a mountain division at Fort Drum, New York and Fort Johnson, Louisiana? That just seems like, <laughs> that seems so, hard. For people that don't know, there's no mountains in either one of those places. So. <laughs> That's not entirely true. And I will push back on the idea that um, they have no military mountaineering capacities right now, because thanks to the leadership of people like uh, Sergeant Dan Fields and uh, and Colonel um, Mark Cleveland, they are they are training. They they are laying down some of that um, essential groundwork necessary to train up a unit um, to, to train as many people as they can. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> Fort Drum. What it does have is proximity to the Adirondacks, and the Adirondacks have great climbing absolutely great climbing they have better ice climbing than we have here in my in my neck of the woods that's for sure and so there there is an opportunity to take advantage of that of that terrain and they are beginning to take advantage of that terrain in order to train but yeah i mean you're taking a, a relatively heavy lift to start with and then you just make it a lot harder <laughs> i've never been to louisiana it's one of the few states i haven't been to um I have been a There's not a lot of mountaineering area. going on. I'll be yeah. I'll be real with you. I haven't seen a lot of stories coming out of the Louisiana mountaineering scene over the course of my career. I thought New Orleans I, was a big ski town, is it not? I I have been down there, You'd not be wrong. stationed there, but I have visited. Um it's a great place to train for swamp warfare. I don't know about mountain warfare, but <laughs> The 10th Swamp Division doesn't have the same <laughs> ring as the 10th Mountain Division. And I don't, I, I can only conceptualize what the patch would look like. Anyway, I will say, you know, um, you know, so much of the emphasis of the 10th Mountain Division back in, back in World War II was on the develop of the development of these mountaineering capacities. But when they got to Italy and they actually were, in, they were inserted into, you know, into the Apennines in order to break the Gothic line. Number one, they were synonymous with the ski troops. So I've got a cover of um, Life magazine right here, and it's got a ski trooper on it. It was the most prominent magazine in the country at the time. Um, they were known um, just throughout the country as skiers, as a unit of skiers. And they did train their asses off to ski, but it was the sort of skiing that I like to do. It's sort of ski mountaineering, you know, where you have big packs and you're going in for multiple days and all that sort of stuff. When they got to Italy and they began to fight, those skill sets were never, apart from Reaver Ridge, they were never called into, they were never needed, right? They weren't skiing, obviously. They weren't, um, they didn't have any ropes after Reaver Ridge. They didn't have any crampons or pitons. They didn't need to ascend any vertical cliffs or anything like that. But that fitness of the, mountain athlete that I talked about and that esprit de corps, that fellowship of the rope, that's what gave them their success. And so, you know, you can train as a, as a mountaineer and it has incredible applicability to other scenarios because you get fucking strong. Mm -hmm. And what I love about climbing is you get strong, not just because, you know, you go into the gym and lifting weights, you get strong because you love to be in the mountains. And if you go into the mountains, you know, propelled by that love again and again and again, 
you get strong as a, as a direct result, but it's not like you're, 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 you're training out of guilt or anything like that. You're training out of love. And what we all know is the greatest motivator in life is not guilt. It's not fear. It's love. So I just think of these guys, you know, both the, these folks today and then the guys from World War II, their training was so successful because of all these attributes that make climbing what we, you know, as climbers, it's, it's why we love what we love to do. It's why we love to be in the mountains. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think about the 10th Mountain Division today and, you know, there's plenty of skepticism out there. Um, and General Anderson's moving on. He's moving up, which is a really good thing. And I'm hopeful that he'll be able to safeguard the advances that have ma- been made to date. But what I would point out is that you, we need a mountain unit, not just because we need those capacities, but because we need a unit that can think on its feet and execute without a lot of uh, oversight and kick ass when it's necessary to kick ass. And they're able to do so because of all that training that they've, that they've undergone as a direct result of this thing that's just absolutely amazing to do. So I have a pretty good idea of this from some of the things you've mentioned already, but but how has present day 10th Mountain responded to the work you've done on the podcast? And then with a slightly more direct question, are you now in the 10th Mountain Division Hall of Fame? <laughs> um, uh, let's see, how would I answer that? So um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we've got a bromance going on. Um, I've gone out there uh two or three times um I've, I've i've given some talks out there um i'm now serving as a special advisor to the 10th mountain alpine club which is this ancillary organization they've set up to be able to get around all the military bureaucracy and actually get some shit done bless their hearts yeah and uh i did go down to um uh, yeah so I, i'm talking to them all the time um I, I went down to Camp Hale this, what, two weeks ago, and I um, begged them to let me do this thing called the, the Hale to Vail Traverse, which is a 20, it's like 25 miles from Camp Hale to Vail. And it was a recreation of an event that occurred during the divisional series of February, 1944. And, uh, you know, that just was another eye opener to what it takes to get all these folks trained up in order to execute something like that. Um, I put together this thing called the 90 pound rucksack challenge on February, February 18th to commemorate the ascent of Reaver Ridge. And I did that with the 10th mountain Alpine club and we held it in three spots around the country. We did it at um, white face mountain out of Lake Placid, which is where they, an, an early incarnation of the 10th trained. We did another one at ski Cooper, which is adjacent to camp Hale. And then we did one here in the Tetons on a peak called Mount Glory. Of course, the call sign is of the 10th is climb to glory. And um, the whole point of that is to try to create ways for the public to step into this in an active way, because that's how you're going to get insights into the contributions that these guys made to outdoor recreation, um, as well as just how fucking hard it is to walk uphill with 90 pounds on your back. And I, you know, I carried 80 pounds and uh, maybe I could have done 90, but, you know, Mount Glory starts at the top of Teton Pass. It's around, what, 8,500 feet, tops out around, uh, I think it's like a little over 10,000. So around 15, 1,600 feet. And every single step of the way, you know, I had this big pack with water that I could pour out so I didn't have to ski with it because they used to ski with this shit. Every step of the way, I just kept thinking about, oh, my God. I mean, these guys were training with this sort of weight on their back. It's mind boggling. It's just, I, you know, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have had a, the same sort of appreciation for what they were up against. And if I hadn't done the hail to veil traverse, I wouldn't have an appreciation for what they're trying to do today. And it's intense and it's daunting. And it's a, it's a huge endeavor and I will do everything I can to help them. Well, it's interesting. And I kind of want to pull on that a little bit because we have had folks from, I mean, from the United States military, we've had folks from the British military talk about the role that I guess you could call it outdoor recreation, like the role that that plays in a lot of the things that you're talking about, the spirit of core and just sort of the development of the fitness and I'm kind of curious, and maybe this is two parts, I'm not quite sure, but like I'm kind of curious about how that 
you mentioned they set the foundation for outdoor recreation in the United States, kind of as we perceive it today. But tangentially, I'm curious is like you mentioned the 10th Mountain in, in the modern era, trying to revitalize some of that stuff, the Alpine Club and things like that. I'm just curious what role, you know, big O, big R outdoor recreation has played in, in this maybe post World War II and then up into today, if that makes sense. Well, um, the industry that's plugged in, and perhaps this isn't surprising, is the, um, I wouldn't even call it the industry. The National Ski Patrol System had a central role in the development of the original unit. And on the Sail to Vail Traverse, uh, there were I think uh, 10 or so National Ski Patrol people. Um, and so they are very excited to lean back into that historic relationship. I have been over fucking backward, pardon my friends, trying to get America's climbers to reprise the role that they had in the original unit by helping out the current unit with its training. Hmm. And I have gotten almost no traction. And it's just, it's frustrating the hell out of me because my predecessor at the American Alpine Journal was a fellow named H. Adams Carter. He had been a central figure in the development of the original 10th Mountain Division. So for me to be contributing in this way is a way to um, honor the service that he provided to the military in this, in this wartime scenario back in, in the early 1940s. But trying to get other climbers to contribute in similar ways, is, it's been, I haven't gotten very far, to be frank. But that's why I created the 90 pound rucksack challenge because you know people love to suffer. Um, at least in the in the climbing and the mountaineering world, you know, this is kind of what we do with a challenge like, you know, walk up 1500 feet with 90 pounds on your back. <laughs> That's like it at night, you know, it was driving blizzard when we did it here in the Tetons. Um, it's actually super cool. And mm -hmm. by doing that, like I had some young friends who did it and they were like, that was fucking awesome, man. Those guys were badasses. It sort of gives you an insight into how tough they were. But then it also makes you curious about them. And so you become more interested in the, uh, the story of how they came about and then how they contributed out to wreck as we understand it today. Mm -hmm. So trying to create these entry points that meet people where they're at, it's one of the things I think I might be able to help with. So that's where mm -hmm. I'm putting my energy. I can, to a certain degree, shout out another piece of the industry that has contributed. And that's just the gear part of the whole thing. Cause like having briefly been in the 10th mountain, I think my gators were black diamond and they got like reasonably nice snowshoes. I think the skis are starting to catch up. I was never and this speaks to like the irony of where the 10th mountain was at the time I was in it. I never got on skis a single time in my capacity in the 10th mountain. And I think only like one company in the whole division did. And they were not like terribly modern skis. Um, boot line fractures were a huge issue when you start getting into serious terrain and things like that. Um, but I can, I can say that I was very glad to be at Fort drum like decades after where we have like gear that's actually warm and works pretty well, even when it gets wet and things like that. I can't imagine going through it with the state that gear was in, in the forties. When I was down in, uh, Camp Hill, we went to ski Cooper and it was a, it was a day all about the 10th. And I've got an advisory board with 90 pound rucksack and they're sort of the foremost experts on the 10th. And they have uh, one of them, Dave Little, he's the living historian of, of the division. And so he's compiled this <laughs> incredible array of that original gear. And I tried, I found a pair of the ski slash mountain boot that was developed at huge expense for the mountain troops. And I got a pair of their seven foot ridgetop hickory skis painted white, about the width of a fucking pencil with the uh, Kandahar bindings. These are cable throw bindings. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have um, as much time as I wanted. So I just sort of, uh, I kind of like walked up, I don't know, a few hundred feet or something and turned around and tried to ski down. And you're just like, oh my fucking God. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in bedroom slippers on these needles, these seven foot, you know, these seven foot needles these hickory needles, they have steel edges, but barely. And my foot is in this little bear, bear claw binding, wobbling around, about to pop out. 
And the thought of doing that with 90 pounds on your back, going both up and down, you're just like, oh my God. And you look at some of the videos that came out of, they made movies of their training and they were crushing it. They mm -hmm. were skiing elegantly. They were skiing in concert. Like they were all skiing together, making these beautiful swoopy turns with these huge packs on their backs. Wearing that same equipment I was on, Uber. <laughs> I don't know how they did it. I mean, those guys were such badasses. They were so tough, so much tougher than we are today. I briefly owned a pair of those skis. I ended up giving them as a gift to a guy who went to Afghanistan with the Tenth Mountain Division. But yeah, that and I, I certainly never got on them on snow. Would have been terrifying. I mean, the bindings do not seem like something that's remotely acceptable for going into actual <laughs> mountains <laughs> terrifying i was looking down at my planes as i was skiing and you know the front of my boot was just like bobbing up over the yeah. body going back down there's no way it would have stayed on in any sort no. of anything other than the mellow groom trail do you think that like i guess the difficulty associated with all that and that's not to say that in like modern day they should train with needles and bear claw bindings but you mentioned earlier some of the challenges that the the, the current command staff has had in trying to reinstitute some of that stuff do you think it has to do with the difficulty or the perceived difficulty of training up to that standard or is there something else at play that's kind of pushing back bureaucratically when it comes to returning 10th mountain to its former glory so to speak oh it's so multifaceted right just, you know, you got the uh, internal skepticism, you've got just the sheer difficulty of getting an entire fucking division to understand how to move competently in the mountains. Um, yeah, I mean, there's companies that are stepping forward and engaging, but they're doing so because it's business. You know, it's not like they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart. It's not like they're looking back at history and being like, well, you know, the American... Um, the climbing and skiing industries before the war contributed. So we should too. They're doing it because they're making money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're just up against so many different challenges right now. I feel like it's just history all over again. It's almost exactly, it's not almost exactly because we're not at war, but they're up against a lot of the challenges that that original incarnation of the 10th had to face. But I mean, at the same time though, like now there's the body of, work that the 10th mountain already put in and, and granted we're not fighting you know the same kind of wars that we were back in world war ii but uh, you know like you mentioned when the genesis of this thing in the 40s they had nothing to base their claims off of but now you could argue that they could look back and say hey you know this was an environment in a scenario where this was actually quite a critical you know skill that we needed and i guess looking at the previous war in the middle east like yeah there's there's a mountain component to it i'm just curious how given now that they do have something that they can refer back to there's still so much pushback are you surprised when we fail to no. learn history <laughs> not at all not at all <laughs> now case in point you know in 1942 um colonel anzo rolf who was the commanding officer of the you know this incarnation it was the 87th uh, mountain infantry regiment um he understood that these really competent folks like John McCown, who were coming into the unit, if he sent them off to OCS and they did not return to him, he would lose all the institutional knowledge that he just spent time and resources developing. So he carved out an exception that allowed them to come back into the unit, thereby retaining that institutional knowledge. The exact same circumstances are at play here today. So if you if you're training up like you know there were what ten of us or so ten of the kids on the uh, the hail the veil traverse were from the tenth if you're training them up and they've got the skill sets and that fitness necessary to do something like that and then they rotate out what do you do start from scratch if you don't carve out that exception you're going to lose that institu institutional knowledge. Mm -hmm. General Anderson's aware of this, and Command Sergeant Major Mobar has been talking about the ways that they are uh, retaining that institutional knowledge by keeping people within the 10th. 
But yeah, I mean, it's the exact same thing they were up against 80 motherfucking years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and so like when I'm telling the story, you know, I feel like half the time in the back of my head is like, tell it in a way that these guys today can be like, oh, well, that's how we can address this problem because it's already been addressed once. And a lot of times that's the blueprint for what's going on today. Does kind of the emergence and popularization of special operations factor into this at all? Because we've talked, I mean, we talked to the commander up at the special operations warfare school and my, my sense from where I sit just as a civilian in all of this is that the military has migrated towards an environment where the really special skills now get focused towards these small units. And the assumption is that at a, a large scale conventional army, you know, 10th, 101st, 82nd, 3rd, like th those guys are just meant to be like ground forces, light infantry, whatever you want to call it. And so let's take the skill sets away from those because it doesn't make sense to invest the time, energy, resources to do it at scale. And let's push it more towards these smaller, more capable units. Does that factor in at all to the pushback to have a division go through that training? Or is that just me making stuff up? Above my pay grade. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I'm a climbing historian. <laughs> No, that's totally fair. Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, trying to peer into the the opacity that is the American military system. Mm -hmm. Man, I struggle every single day understanding how it works. And I know, you know, as often as not, there's a right way to do things and there's the army way to do things. And I don't necessarily understand why the army works the way that it does. And Sometimes I don't think I even want to know why the army works the way it does. But yeah, I mean, my my understanding is fairly limited. At this well, point. I mean, I, I kind of asked that because you mentioned the institutional knowledge piece. And I'm thinking back to these guys, you know, World War II time frame. If, if they, these guys were highly specialized. I mean, they were doing some really cool stuff. And when I think about guys in today's age doing the same thing, the first thing you would tell that person is like, oh, you should go assess you should go to the next level and in world war ii that next level wasn't i mean it was there a little bit but not really so it's just interesting to have these conversations with senior leaders about retaining this knowledge when now there's so much other opportunity for them versus going and sitting at fort polk pretending that you're in a mountain division well i know um you know because i'm here in the tetons and <clears throat> i've got a lot of friends who are guides we've got a couple of guide services here and there will be special units that come through mm -hmm. special forces forces units that come through to train in the mountains. And, you know, and talking to my friends about them, they're obviously really competent and really fit, but again, it's the sort of fitness that as often as not, you get it in a gym mm -hmm. and that kind of fitness, you know, looks great on a beach and you can get certain things done, but it's not the sort of functional fitness that you need when you're moving around in the mountains. And, you know, if you look at somebody who's a really good climber, I mean, number one, it's like all body types, but you don't see somebody who's jacked because going into the mountains again and again and again, you get lean. I mean, in order to go for 24 hours at a push, you have to build up to the level where you can actually do that. And that's just years and years and years of going in into the mountains. So you get as much as anything else, you get people who are just really, um, they're just really lean. And, you know, that's just sort of a, a physical manifestation of the skill sets and the sort of fitness necessary to execute in the mountains. But it's interesting talking to my guide friends about the folks that are coming through here. And like anything that's outside of a very sort of a uh, very finite purview, like, you know, there's a, here's your mission. Um, it's very well defined and you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to execute. If another variable comes up, that the ability of that unit to execute becomes quickly compromised mm -hmm. because the, the fitness levels and the skill sets haven't necessarily been um, evolved to handle those sorts of variables. Hmm. Well, since you mentioned not really understanding how the army or the military operates, um, <laughs> if you ever feel like some light reading, there is a document called How the Army Runs. Um, it's, it's only like 540 pages. It's a quick read. Nothing crazy. You know I'm what? We I'm should sure you'll do, love it. We should do a spinoff, 100 pound rucksack, <laughs> just narrative podcast that goes through that. Just episode, <laughs> episode of how the army runs. 
<laughs> you only have to put one copy of the textbook in the rucksack and it's a hundred pound <laughs> rucksack. You're good to go. Oh, I'll ask quick. Cause we're getting, we're, I think we've already hit the hour mark here, but real briefly your, your podcast is a work in progress. You're still, you're still building it. You're still recording episodes. Where are we going in the next few? What can we look forward to? Well, this next one is uh, finishing up the the gear and the equip the equipment, the clothing, the the food, and then how it actually laid the groundwork for out there wrecking America today. And then I'm getting into kind of the more um, perhaps well known chapters of the of the division's history. So after that comes Camp Hale. So looking at the training they did at 9,000 feet in this valley in between Leadville and Minturn, Colorado. Um, and from there, you know, we, we're just going to follow all these major milestones. But I think the fun thing, or at least it's been fun for me, um, has been to look at some of the stories that haven't seen the light of day. And so you mentioned Seneca Rocks. And this was a, uh, a place where it was called the Lowland Training. And it was a sort of a tenth adjacent. And it had part of the mountain training group who, who came out of the tent um, as the instructors. And yet it's, it's absolutely its own history. But they trained thousands of soldiers to be able to climb. And those soldiers post-war, when they went back out into America and started recreating using all the army, army surplus stuff that they could now buy for pennies on the dollar, that is why Outdoor Rec exploded, in part because not just of Camp Hale, but Seneca Rocks. So I love going into, there'll be a lot on, on those sort of lesser known chapters in the division's history as well the uh the only reason i know about seneca rocks is because once upon a time i was a, a new captain at fort drum and had to plan a training event for a bunch of lieutenants and i don't know where it came up but like i think one of the majors wanted there to be like a historical like heritage connection to it so i i remember making a slide of like here's a few names you could name it and seneca rocks was one and d series was one and i think there's still I think I saw something on their like social media last year about like a D series challenge thing and stuff. So they're, they're doing all that stuff. It's cool to see. Yeah. They just finished it up. Yeah. Yeah. They do it every year. So before we let you go, I got to ask, I mean, obviously the name of the podcast is the 90 pound rucksack, but is, are, are there other places people can go to either find more about the, the show specifically, but I'm kind of really interested in a lot of this archival historical stuff. Like where would you direct people that kind of enjoy this kind of story? Well, uh, you can find 90 Pound Rucksack wherever you find your podcast, so Apple or Spotify. Uh, you can find it on my website. That's christianbeckwith.com. Um, you know, if you really want to go deep and you can go as deep as you'd ever want to go, go to the Denver Public Library because they hold the archives for the 10th Mountain Division. Oh, wow. And it has no bottom. I mean, you <laughs> do backstrokes in it from here until eternity and you won't get to the end of that ocean. I guess I'm going up to Denver. All right. I was about to say, Alex is going down to Denver, <laughs> man. Well, thanks for coming on and talking to us. I appreciate it. This has been incredibly interesting for me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And, and whatever I can do to help. I mean, I think um, fitness and climbing and mountaineering, they just go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just because it's not because we're, you know, bulking up in the gym to go do these climbs. We're, we're getting lean and getting fit because we love to be in the mountains. And I just really hope the 10th Mountain Division can lean into that because the result will be a force that the country needs. How do I start these things again? I don't, I don't remember how we start these things. I think we just talk. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this latest episode of Mops and Moes with Christian Beckwith talking about the history of the 10th Mountain. And, um, you know, admittedly, a little bit of a deviation from the normal talks about reps and sets, but I, for one, had no clue about the role that 10th Mountain played in kind of the development of outdoor recreation, climbing, skiing, et cetera. So for me, as far as takeaways go, like that was pretty cool. I'd heard, and I mentioned this to Christian, I'd heard one episode or not one episode, but one podcast prior from a different podcast about the history of the 10th, but obviously the work that he's doing is way more in depth. And then you add the Alpine element in his background to it. And it's just super cool. One of the questions I get all the time on the Instagram DMS is like, what is the ultimate hobby for tactical professionals? And first off, I mean, I don't really think people, I don't think people like actually choose hobbies based on being better at their job. I think they choose hobbies based on what they enjoy, but 
the the most common ones I hear people propose are like jujitsu and powerlifting and CrossFit and things like that. Um, and I think there's a pretty good case made in this conversation and a conversation that will has not published yet in real time, but will have published a few weeks before this one in your time as listeners. Um, the the episode about special operations mountain warfare. Um, but between those two, I think there's a pretty good argument that like outdoor sports in general, things that get you into the mountains, things that get you do in like expedition type activities where you start having to like think about the logistics of like really long, physically intense things. I think there's a, a real conversation there about how applicable those are to military jobs. So I think there's maybe we go down that rabbit Which, hole some other day. You but. know, as you're saying that is interesting to me. And and I say this from like being inside the fence, because they have seen, you know, since maybe this is too long of a time scale, but since the end of World War II to now, more and more money seems to be invested and resources seem to be invested into bringing training like closer to the gym, into the facility mm -hmm. with all the equipment, very like objectified rep sets, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And more and more hurdles have been created to take training outside across longer distances and more austere environments. And I'm literally just like thinking of this as I'm saying it, but you know, he mentioned in the episode, a lot of the things that the 10th mountain guys around the world war II timeframe were doing, going out to this objective, doing this thing, doing that thing. And while he was saying that, all I was thinking to myself was like, man, anytime I've ever seen that pulled off nowadays, you got to go through a contracting company that has to be put up for bid against three other things and blah, 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 blah. And the lowest bidder, yada, yada, yada. You can't spend the money because of the color. Like, so anyway, maybe we're, there's a, we're basically there's a reverse program. engineering the conversation we had when we were talking about the British Royal Army Physical Training Corps yeah. of adventurous training. Like we're just, we're, we're coming full circle and realizing that maybe barbells in I indoor wonder. facilities is not the ultimate fitness and like maybe you do need to actually use your fitness and like go outside and like do hard things in serious terrain look at us man maybe we've just nullified the whole purpose of mobs and mo's and we should uh -oh. just we're changing the name of the podcast to birds and bees <laughs> outdoor edition ah that's weird okay that's a pretty uh, weird name we'll have to workshop that one we'll, a bit. yeah bees and birds we're we're gonna play with that but uh thanks again for listening stay tuned and uh we will see you next week hey alex let's cover our ass real quick oh great idea drew all right guys the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do, do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities they represent Thanks for tuning into this week's episode. Before you go, please rate and review the pod on the listening platform of your choice. You can also visit us on our website at www.mopsinmos.com. That's mops, the letter in mos.com. You can check out the library of podcast episodes, our latest blog entries, any helpful resources, and also sign up for our newsletter. Drew nailed it. Just to underline a couple of things, the podcast entries have in-depth show notes on the website. So if you missed anything or you want to read any of the research we talk about, it is all there. You can, at the bottom of the website, sign up with your email and receive future updates from us. The blog posts go a little bit more in-depth and kind of written form on a couple of topics we get questions about all the time. But most importantly, I just want to ask all you guys, our best way the word gets out is absolutely word of mouth. So tell your friends, tell the people you work with, anybody you think would find it useful. Thanks for spreading the word. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to shoot us an email at either Drew or Alex at mopsandmos.com. Or there's a contact form on the website.